today with this panel, we're about to speak about how you can, you know, take it a step further, what artists can do themselves um, to expand their reach and be heard a lot more. So to moderate this panel today, we've got the man, Phil Chad. Round of applause for Phil, please. All the way from Zimbabwe. I've known Phil for, Phil, how many years have I known you now? Seven years, man. And it's beautiful, you know, connecting is just a beautiful thing when it comes to African music. And through that, he's been exposed to Ghanaian artists and I've been exposed to artists from Zim and it's just beautiful. So thank you, Phil, for coming through. We also have the Director of Distribution for Orchard South Africa, Impumi Phillips. Thank you for being here. Round of applause for her. Philip Eduse, the founder of Unorthodox Media from Ghana. Shouts, mm. bro. Uh, we also have Larissa Feinberg. I hope I said the name right. Did I say it right? Larissa. 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 Sorry, Larissa. Editorial and marketing partnerships for Believe South Africa. We heard from you yesterday, I believe. Yes, no pun intended. Um, Yuvir, did I say that right? Yeah, Yuvir. Yuvir is also from South Africa, and he's a TikTok music operations manager, which is incredible. TikTok has been like big in the last couple of years. So, Phil, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antoine. Morning, everyone. Are you guys there? Yeah. There we go. Um, so yeah, I think the tone and the angle for this panel is mainly going to be towards artists and their management or PR teams. Um, and I think before we begin, I think let's just go around the room and outside of the introductions that Antoine gave, please just give a brief introduction to what you do and what your biggest pain point with trying to help artists reach a wider audience is at your job. So if we could start with you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Larissa Feinberg. I am the Editorial and Marketing Partnership Specialist at Believe Africa. Um, I'm based in Johannesburg, but uh, through our network of label managers across the continent, as well as label managers um, in the UK and in Europe who represent African artists, I pitch to the DSPs on behalf of African artists. Um, my biggest pain point is planning, 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 planning. Um, something that we try to really work very closely with independent artists and independent labels on is forward planning, uh, having a long tail strategy, having a long lead, thinking about not just the next release, but the next five releases down the line, the next EP, album or project down the line, the content that you're building around it, as well as the marketing and promotions strategy that will support the release especially working closely hand in hand with the likes of Yuvira Pele and TikTok. As you know, TikTok has become a massive global phenomenon in driving <coughs> music consumption and awareness of new emerging artists. So for me, I would say that's something that is an ongoing challenge with uh, independent artists and independent labels who are used to the DIY thing, are used to sort of getting something out there, out into the streets and having it done. Uh, when we deal sort of at a believe level that is more sort of akin to uh, sort of a global traditional record label, but still, you know, respecting the independence of artists, we work within the protocols of what uh, the DSPs and the other technology partners require in terms of that placement, visibility, playlist editing, etc. Um, and that takes time. Uh, so hopefully, uh, by working closely with artists, we'll, we'll get that right for Indies in Africa. Pumi? Um, yes, my name is Mbumi. As they've said, I come from the Orchard uh, South Africa office. We also have an office in Kenya as well as Nigeria. Those resources, you have to take a lot of those responsibilities on yourself. And as Mbumi says, do that work, you know, put in that grind. Yeah. Um, I think both you and Larissa, you guys mentioned some of the online resources that are available. Um, do your organizations have like a hub of free resources that, uh, that artists can have access to? Or if not, can you point them in the direction of some resources that they can turn to for this information? Um, well, with our clients, we always provide them that type of, those type of resources. We always send them, you know, all the different DSPs, best, um, best practices, um, information, and obviously information. Um, now that we're living in the age of technology, it's not a situation of, you know, what was done with one DSP, you know, 2021, 20, I mean, 2020 even, is still going to be relevant in 2021. So it's, it's our job to always ensure that we're always up to date with what is it that the DSPs have changed, what what now is the new best practice for them and making sure that our clients are updated on those type of things. So, um, yeah, that's what that's pretty much what we do as well. But I think with the different DSPs as well, they do have those things on their sites as well. Okay. 
So, Yavir, if someone wanted to access some of those resources for TikTok, where could they go? Uh, in terms of actually best practices, most of the distributors, DSP, um, distributors, uh, labels, all of them have the stuff. If you are independent and you want the resources, as I said, we don't we don't actively like just throw it out there. Uh, it's more of a case of finding a way to contact us. Our, our, my, my email address is like everywhere. So it, it, if you do the research, search for, for me, you'll find it. You'll definitely be able to drop me a mail. OK, perfect. Um, there, there was a question that um, an artist did ask me yesterday that I think is also very pertinent to this conversation, which is in the age of COVID, and we're now probably entering another fourth wave here. Um, live streams have become one of the few ways that they can interact with their fans. Um, but one of the things that artists are struggling with is getting their songs whitelisted on streaming platforms or licensing to festivals and other platforms. Do you guys have any tips on how best an artist can ensure that when they start performing their song, the stream doesn't get cut off by various um, social media platforms? Again, it goes back to number one, planning. Um, you cannot do a, um, a, a concert shoot to stream today and then tomorrow put it out on platforms. You, number one, have not contacted your distributor or your label to say, hey guys, this is what I've done. Can you whitelist this? This is what needs to be, because the, the, we are able to do that whitelisting for you, but we need the time in order to do it. Um, and we need to understand what it is that you are actually doing for how long. So that, because at the end of the day, whitelisting is there for your protection. It's not necessarily there to just you know, be a gatekeeper. So when you need that opened up, you need to be able to come, number one, in proper timing so that the right things are able to be done for that um, particular channel or site, um, and so that we understand what it, is, what, what it is it behind it, and you also understand where your income revenues will be coming from, from that as well. Okay. Larissa, anything to add? Yes, um, uh, you know, just to add to that, I'd also advise the particular artist of the particular label to consider you know, whether um, their resources can allow for that particular format. So a live stream concert uh, you know, with full production, with full band, et cetera, uh, sound engineers, you know, that's all cost intensive and that's all resource intensive. Um, is there a better way to uh, utilize those resources to put your music out there in a video format that uh, is more sort of easy on your wallet, but also more digestible and can reach your fans. You know, perhaps you can do short form video content that you put across uh, various social media platforms. Uh, perhaps you can do uh, pre-recorded content that you can see it on socials, you can see it on YouTube, TikTok, you can see it on uh, particular DSPs who have that uh, facility, you know, such as, you know, Huawei have a Huawei video, and Huawei video has a relationship with Huawei music, they can kind of cross-pollinate, you can create a campaign, with them, etc. You know, maybe you can deliver content into Boomplay that's exclusive to Boomplay. Perhaps you can do some, you know, uh, short form video content for Triller or Audio Mac or Mdundo, uh, depending on, uh, you know, what their specs and requirements are. And then again, tying back to what Mpumi said, plan well in advance with your label or with your distributor. Uh, you know, have that mapped out, ensure that uh, you film the content on time, ensure that it's delivered on time, ensure that it's whitelisted for you, if it's YouTube as an example, uh, so that there aren't any hiccups in the process. Um, you know, people talk a lot about live stream, and live stream is sort of, you'd think logically is the, is the natural translation from brick and mortar to sort of, you know, the internet space in terms of a performance, that isn't always a viable option. It might be if, you know, you have the resources for it, but again, you know, if you want to monetize that live stream, that's also a challenge in terms of what is your payment gate? How does one purchase tickets? How do you ensure that you actually get paid for that performance? Um, you know, if it's a label trying to organize it or if it's a DSP trying to organize it, there's a performance fee involved. So, you know, before you say, you know, how do I ensure that my live stream goes up correctly? Think about, should I be doing a live stream? What are my options and what is best for me? Oh, thank you. I just want to add on, on live, because <laughs> we, 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 we're doing a lot uh, with live, as you can expect uh, right now. So on TikTok, our, our TikTok brand is called TikTok Live. Anybody can go live on TikTok. Uh, if you have in South Africa, you just need 800 followers. I think that's the, the number um, all over Africa. Um, 
With the platform, we, we do focus on what we call promoted lives. So how, what promoted lives is we'll do like, if uh, like uh, an artist that's, that's working with us uh, is doing a live, we'll do a banner placement for the live, we'll send push notifications, uh, we'll notify other regions that this artist, if they are relevant in the region, um, that they are doing a live um, so that they can actually promote it. With Promoted Live, for example, we did one that we did ourselves, I think like last week or the week before, uh, which was an Ama Piano Live in South Africa. We had over 250,000 viewers globally, which was the biggest live we've done um, in Africa. But besides that, we work with individual artists as well to actually promote their live and see how we can actually get the best audience to come to this live. It's not just them going, okay, let me put my phone on and do it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that, and you definitely should be doing that regularly as an artist. On TikTok, at least, you can earn a little bit of money uh, doing live as well, because you can earn gifts. Uh, and things like basically people, they can buy money and send you gifts if your life is really dope. Um, so with that, that there, is, there is that and we are also developing some kind of technology for uh, buying tickets and all of that. We're not really looking at launching that just yet uh, because we are trying to get people more into the TikTok live format um, and having these as like regular shows that they are tuning into and also making them more interactive because it's not like, this is not you going to a stage show. People want to be able to do something. So I'll give you an example of one, one we did which was really cool was with The Weeknd. So The Weeknd's live was kind of him on stage and then he had things that could change color. So the, his glasses could change color. The song that could, he could perform next, you could select. So it was all like crowd voted for. So you could vote for what you want on the back wall. Do you want a picture of the artist, or do you want a picture of a heart, or, or something like that. So that, like, small little things just making the, the interaction a little bit more. But even not using the technology, you as an artist need to be really creative with live. Live is not you performing on a stage on, online. It needs to be more than that. How are you actually interacting with this audience that can't they can't clap for you, right? So maybe you're asking them for emoji replies. Maybe you're asking them for put your hands up, uh, put your country flag in the comments, uh, something like that. The first person that uh, sends me a, a TikTok logo or whatever, uh, I'm going to give you a like and a follow back on your account. There you are already creating interaction. The first person after my live to do my challenge, use my song to do a challenge, I'll give them a follow and I'll give them a shout out video. That's how you need to use live. It needs to be more interactive. It's not just you jumping on a stage, you know? Um, quick question, you very, don't you think um, artists need to have a certain level of an audience or a following to be able to make the most of the live feature? Yeah, so with live, there's two things. I'm only talking about TikTok, so <laughs> like on live, there's two things. So we do the promoted live. The promoted live, we only really do with artists. It doesn't really matter about celebrity status. It matters whether your song was trending or not, right? So if your song was trending, we use the live as an addition to help promote your song. So the f there's other resources we use first to promote your song, then promote it live. For an artist that doesn't have a trending song, they can go live and they will still get an audience. The way the TikTok algorithm works, it doesn't only send it to your, to your followers, it sends it to anyone that thinks that TikTok thinks will like your content. So you can actually tag your live. So you can say hashtag music, hashtag performance, hashtag hip hop. So people know it's a music performance with hip hop music. So people that like that, maybe they don't know who you are, but anyone in the world that has tagged those likes will tune into your show. So, yeah. OK. Um, before we go to the Q&A, because I see um, time is about to run out, um, there was a question that I received from someone on social media uh, with regards to whitelisting on TikTok. Um, and I think it would be pertinent to a lot of the artists in the room, which was, as a DIY artist using a DIY distributor, um, how best can I get my song whitelisted on TikTok? So yeah, one thing I forgot to mention, with TikTok Live, you can do a DJ set, you can do a performance. We don't take down anything for music copyright on TikTok Live. That doesn't happen. We have different agreements with different distributors and labels for that. In terms of the actual content that you're posting on TikTok, 
it's a little bit different. So basically, if your song has been sent by a record label or distributed to us, then you need to use that, and there's a certain license to it. So we, our license is basically under one minute. If you shoot a video even with your own song that goes over one minute, most likely it will get taken down because of the license agreement you have already done with your distributor. Um, but yeah, in terms of whitelisting, we don't really do whitelisting of audio. We work on very strict license agreements uh, with distributors and, and labels, so yeah. Okay, uh, I think that covers it. Um, so I think at this point we can take it to the audience. Um, if you guys have any questions, please do raise your hands and um, the people in the crowd will be willing to answer. Do we have any questions in the audience? Come on, guys. Anybody? Any takers? <laughs> no, I think, I, th I think this just shows that we covered we all the topics ex extensively. <laughs> I, we, we've covered everything extensively. Um, I think the, the last thing that I, I did want to uh, touch on uh, for Philip, I think it's also pertinent to you. Oh, Antoine, there we go. Um, I just want to ask in relation to, to media, as in you know, TV, radio especially, um, online, uh, but especially TV and, and radio stations that are you know, going digital now. So do a lot of posting, a lot of interviews with artists that come through the studio. You know, next thing you know, we're putting, we're putting the content up on social media. It might have a bit of the music in there. So specifically with whitelisting, um, do these media institutions have to do anything, you know, sign up with any agencies, you know, reach out to the DSPs themselves to be able to get the whitelisting they need, you know, necessarily? Because they're doing it for the artists as part of the promotion. But once they put the videos up sometimes, you know, it gets taken down, they get the notice. Um, so, yeah. Um, do you wanna answer I'll, I'll, I'll answer just for TikTok. Um, <laughs> on TikTok, any piece of video that is over one minute with music, if it's in the background or it's a music video or anything like that, avoid it like at all costs because mm. it's most likely going to get taken down. If you've got music in the background, just make sure your video is less than a minute and you should be fine. Uh, if it's like a three-minute video, break it up into three different clips. That's, that would be the best okay. uh, thing for TikTok at least. And I think um, for a platform like YouTube, it depends on the, aside the length of the video, it depends on the rationale behind the video being in the clip. So for instance, if it's an explanatory video mm. where you're in the studio with the artist, say, explaining the video, that won't get struck down. But then if the video is being played like the video itself, then it will get struck down. So there are bits of nuances to it with regards to the rationale behind. All right. Yeah. Pum, Larissa, anything you want to add? Oh, no, I just wanted to add to that that um, when any sort of licensed content is present in a video that goes up onto YouTube, say it's uploaded by media partner, then just remember that that agreement has to be in place between the media partner and that distributor or that label. So it has to come from the permission of the label or from the artist to have it uploaded. And that permission and that P line is also included in YouTube. So you'll notice that in YouTube, there's always like by permission of or distributed by and the label or um, the distributor's information is always included there. Okay. So that permission, those rights always have to be included before any content is just sort of uploaded by a media partner. So that's the media partner reaching out to the DSP or the label before it's uploaded? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think the last point that I wanted to touch on, um, and it, it's very pertinent since this is a Pan-African uh, festival and you guys all deal with this is collaborations. So I think starting with you, Philip, what's the best way for artists to facilitate Pan-African collaborations and how can they use that to grow their music and grow their reach? Okay, so um, let me start with the second part of the, the question. I think Pan-African collaborations is like one of the best ways to grow right now because currently with the Ama Piano Wave, we have a lot of Nigerian acts jumping on the wave, and they're actually making bigger hits than native South African, even though it's a South African sound. So I believe, <laughs> <laughs> so I believe, yeah, that's, that's the future right now, right, with regards to collaboration. And I think the way to go about it is simply not to box yourself as an artist. We have a lot of artists who say, okay, so I'm, 
say, an R&B artist, so I'm sticking to R&B. But then you should always be open-minded as an artist. Even though you have R&B roots, you should spread your wings and be willing to dabble in new influences and collaborate. So that's what I would say to that. OK, thanks. Um, Larissa and Bumi, on, on the label side, um, how do you guys foster or how do you encourage artists to get collaborations? Um, I think we, I mean, Busiswa had a, an amazing conversation yesterday with regards to collaborations within the, you know, Pan-African market, um, where I'm, I'm in two parts. I do believe that, you know, from a creative perspective, collaborations are very much a, you know, how do we connect type of thing, you know. Um, sometimes it's not as easy for a, you know, a label or a, um, or a distributor to make those things happen because it's, ab it's about two creatives coming together and seeing how, you know, if they gel, if they work, you know. Um, but also, most of your, your, your labels, your distributors should have, you know, artists signed in various territories. It's about a conversation with them, letting them know what it is that you're looking to do. Um, seeing what they have within their roster, um, that they can, you know, try to do that reach out. But at the end of the day, it also goes back to, yes, I may want to do a song with, you know, in South Africa and do a song with Naira Marley, but will Naira Marley want to do a song with me? It's about jelling with each other and understanding each other as well. But I think you have to first have that initial conversation with your label. Have them understand, because at the end of the day, it's, like, it's the same thing as pitching for playlists. Have them understand what what it is the direction that you're trying to go creatively what it is that you're trying to do with the song how you're planning on marketing um you know yourself in that various territory because sometimes you have an artist who will come to you and say um i want to work with a nigerian artist who has numbers that you th were no longer now moving into create getting a creative song we're just trying to just get numbers. And a lot of those times, those songs end up flopping because there wasn't creative synergy that came together. I mean, I've heard a lot of, especially with the South African hip hop earlier on when you know they started doing international collaborations. It's like, you know, the South African artist is talking about, you know, um, A, apples, and the international artist is talking about, you know, um, steak. You know, when the song just didn't gel because there was there was no lyrical synergy. There was it was just because I have, you know, Bumi the superstar on my song, but it didn't really have that that, that it didn't it didn't. And the, most of those songs didn't work. They they actually did flop because we have creatives have to be, they have to be in sync in order to be able to create. You know, so. Yes, labels, um, distributors can try to facilitate those type of things, but I think it's also what Busiso, you know, going back to you know what Busiso was saying yesterday, is to say DM those guys. You know, a lot of those guys, a lot of musicians now are open to those type of um, connections or are open to to listening to someone from a different diaspora that they can, you know, that that approaches them themselves as well. So um, it's in two ways: try to do direct. A lot of the times that works out a lot better, I feel. And you know, then also just have a have a creative marketing meeting with, with your label or your distributor and see what how best they can help you as well. Thanks. Is there anything to add? Um, yeah, no, just a small thing because I see we're running out of time is uh, authenticity. Um, authenticity within yourself. Ensure that, you know, if you okay, you see, I'm a piano is like exploding globally. If that's something that you want to get into, ensure that that fits authentically with your brand as an artist and with your sound. And also authenticity and respect to that genre. You know, don't just appropriate because you see that uh, you, you can ride that coattail and you can leverage that. Um, ensure that you really understand, uh, respect, and appreciate the genre and see how that, that chemistry meets. Well, thank you. Um, so I think before we wrap, if there's any burning points or, or issues that the panelists would like to raise, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I think we've pretty much covered it. No? Okay. There we go. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much.